Um, yeah, let me, let me uh, go over a couple of things. I mean, we'll, we'll, the, the topic, hopefully, I'll touch upon the topic. Um, you never know where you're going to go sometimes, and developments feed the situation. The first thing I want to do is give people a, a, a quick update on the political situation, uh, the strategic situation. Uh, you know, LaRouche does um, meets with the intelligence staff and so forth a couple of times a week. Today was one of them, and we have a, an interesting picture and a, of, a, of a world in crisis. And it's relevant. It, it, the topic of today's discussion hopefully will give you some idea of where we have to go. Because what we face, part of the reason that we're looking at the 20th century and the, you might say, the epistemology or the basic ideas that have guided the 20th century into the 21st century is how we got into this mess. It, it wasn't always like this. Uh, and I don't mean in terms of some of the benefits that we have. There are some benefits that we have. But what's the direction? What's the course of events? What's the view that human beings have of themselves? Because to a large extent, whether or not we're going to make it into the future really depends on what we think the value of human beings is. What's the value of a human life? What's the value of the human mind? What's wealth in society? What's wealth in an economy? And this, of course, is, is a, a, a deep question now because, in fact, the system that we're living in, the economic system, the dominant economic system, is dead. Now, that's not a great situation. In other words, the direction of the present physical economy is towards zero. Now, um, part of this, part of what I'm doing, just so people know, is that uh, we've had an eight-part series on the mission of taking the present world economy toward Mars. A mission of expanding human discovery into the solar system. This was presented by uh, a number of members of the LaRouche Youth Movement. Many of you were here, I think, um, for at least parts of that. Now, that series ended um, last week. And actually, a new series will begin, and I can uh, sometime in the beginning of the year. Uh, early, I mean, somebody else may be able to tell you, Dennis or Jerry, uh, the exact plan, but that it is a new series to be planned, which will continue the work on LaRouche's phys economic principles, physical economy, the principles of that, and how this kind of mission orientation in detail would affect the economy of the, not only the United States, but the globe. What kind of jobs, what kind of, uh, what, what kind of building we would have to undertake. Now, so in the interim, I mean, I'm going to do something here today. People can ask questions later on when we take a break. We'll, we'll certainly leave at least, uh, you know, half hour, 45 minutes or more for questions. And you can, if you want, ask questions about prior classes. I don't know if I can answer them, but you can ask them. Uh, there's no, no penalty on asking them. Um, uh, so hopefully people will uh, continue to attend these classes and maybe bring some other people. But now I think that, that what I want to take a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes, and we'll even take uh, some questions, um, is to go over where we stand politically. Because what we have at the moment, and we've had since really July of 2007, and some of you may recall, LaRouche did a webcast July 25th, 2007, in which he said, look, we're about to enter a disintegration of the present financial system. And that a lot of this was an outcome 
of the, you know, the speculation in uh, securitized mortgages. It wasn't the mortgages. I mean, I, I can tell you some funny stories from I was out in California for a lot of this, and some of what was said about the subprime mortgages was completely insane. These were basically financial instruments. They had nothing to do with houses. They were essentially pyramided financial instruments which reflected the nature of the speculative financial system that we exist in. Now, when that mortgage bubble blew out and LaRouche said it was going to blow out, what he said was this, is, this was the final blow to the system. There's no way out of what they were in. I mean, the example of this is, you know, uh, my favorite story is, uh, you know, a lot of Americans, and this is something we'll get to, rather foolishly w went on and on about, you know, people who deceptively got mortgages. You know, some, some poor guy who went in and got a $800,000 mortgage and couldn't afford it. Okay, and blamed it on, say, well, you see these people deceived the banks. Now, I, I think it takes a lot of gullibility, really, to be honest with you, to believe that. Well, I happen to know yeah. that they, there were some banks that were giving mortgages to people yeah. at a ridiculous I know someone uh, personally yeah. who bought a three hundred thousand dollar house. She didn't have money, but she was sent yeah. to but someone who had contact. Yeah, the banks she wanted to do that. Three thousand dollars down. On that but the house. banks wanted if to do I that. I bought a house for one hundred and fifty thousand. This I had to put. You see, 15, but this is the banks wanted to do the this. The lawyers were referring these people to certain people in banks. The that banks was. wanted to do it. And the, the classic case on the West Coast was they, they took a, a, a guy who had about four or six kids who was a, a legal immigrant from Mexico who was a, 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 a landscaper. And they gave him a mortgage of $800,000. Now, of course... The guy said put his entire family to work. And of course, they brought them in on initial payments. These are these adjusted rate mortgages, the zero interest rate mortgages. The, you, know, you don't pay anything for the first two-year two mortgage. Now, what's the idea? They, they needed, they were, they were building a huge chain letter mortgage bubble. Now, the idea in a bubble is there's always somebody else to sell it to. Okay, so now once you, what happens when the people you're selling them to in a service economy, in an economy without manufacturing jobs, and they're getting low wages, what do you do? Well, you put, you take, you go to, to the low wage people and you sell them a deal. And here's the deal. You get this mortgage. It's going to be lower rates to begin with. After two or three years, the rates are going to go up. Now, one of two things happens. One is, maybe you'll get a better job. Maybe your income will go up. Maybe landscaping will pay you five times what it's paying now. And if it doesn't, you can sell the house for more money because we've got a bubble going. I want to so, tell you something else. I work for Citibank. Right. Uh, I retired from there, which of course now I'm so frightened that the government seems to own it. You know what the heck they're going to do. But anyway, when I went for a mortgage 30 years ago for that $150,000 house, I, for the $15,000 I was going to put down, they wanted my bank, who employed me, wanted to know if I could put down $20,000 instead. I mean, where did they come? I had a job with them. I was making the money. Because you know, and I can't understand how they went the other way. And I they went worried, the other way because they had to go the other way. This one, yeah. I believe I heard that they were forced to do it. That they weren't forced to do anything. This is the, the, look, you have a financial system which is based on money. This is what we mean by monetarism. The present value of money and the ability of that, the value of that money to grow. And it's all based on a scam. It's based on speculation. The idea is create an, uh, an, uh, an increase in the value of a, a, a financial instrument that you hold based on a bet that that financial instrument will go up in value. Now, what happens 
is you've got to find some income stream to steal. Somebody's got to place the bet. So you begin to go out and you con people into getting these mortgages. And that was just one element of a massive financial bubble. You create financial instruments, one on top of the other. No, look, the truth is nobody knew what these instruments were, including the rocket scientists who were supposedly creating them. What's a mortgage-backed security? A mortgage-backed security is you take a bundle of mortgages of different values and different ratings, and you put them together in slices. So you own one-fifth of your mortgage-backed security is these kinds of mortgages. Two-fifths is these kinds of mortgages. They call them tranches. Okay? And then you bet, based on the ratings of the different mortgages, on the value of that mortgage-backed security. Now that's why they didn't know what these things were worth when they blew out. A lot of these, let me tell you, from a strictly a technical mathematical standpoint, they're what you call recursive functions. So the value of the mortgage can only be figured out after the, some value is plugged into it based on a future sale. So I got news for you. The people who created some of these derivatives, like, like Scholes, uh, Merton and Scholes, who got a, 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 a a Nobel Prize for this, you can't figure the value out. You can, at the point at which it, co it, it collapses, you can't figure the value out because the future value that goes into the recursive function doesn't exist. That's the reality of it. Now, huh? Yeah. Uh, now, the, 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 here's... Here, huh? They bundle the mortgages. They put a whole yeah. bunch of them together. Yeah, but then you use another term. I lost it. Um, slices. You, slices. You put different slices in them. So in one mortgage-backed security, one-fifth of the bundle is a certain rated mortgage, a tranche, I called it. Tranche. Just a certain slice of it, so to speak. Okay? Now, what's the point? The idea is you, get, you have to steal income to back up in some level these mortgages. So you begin to bring people in whose income you normally wouldn't capture because they couldn't afford the mortgage. In a normal set setup, they, they wouldn't be eligible for the mortgage. So you bring them in to steal some portion of their income and prop up the mortgage that way. And you, you, you keep the chain letter going. Now, obviously, at a certain point, this all blew out. And they look, they've got, how, what have they done since then? They've tried to create a new series of bubbles based on the bailout money, based on as much as $24 trillion in actual money, yeah, or guarantees and so on and so forth. Now, what happens? Did this, does this go into any investment? Does it go into credit to small business? No, it does not, because it's money. And money has to grow fast, particularly in a, what LaRouche has pointed out, is a potentially hyperinflationary situation where you've got trillions of dollars that are chasing effectively n more trillions of dollars that's supposed to represent the profits and the growth, which is not going to come from any normal economic activity. Normal economic activity, good economic activity, might have a growth rate of between 5 and 10% per year. Not 10 and 15 and 20% overnight. That's monetarism. So the, the, the value of the economy is measured in the immediate profitability of financial monetary instruments. And the only value that exists is what's the value of your money or instruments attached to simple monetary values. Now, what Lynn said in July of 2007 is this system has now created essentially a monstrous parasite called the bubble, the financial bubble, that is unsustainable. And all they've done is they've tried to roll it over into new areas out of what? Shifting the debt to the public or bailout. Now, what does this mean? It means what we saw in 1923 in Germany, except on a global scale. 
It means massive Weimar-style hyperinflation is what everybody knows looms behind this bubble. The only reason it hasn't exploded is frankly because for the moment people are willing to accept the idea that it won't happen. As soon as, as, soon as it becomes apparent that these prices are going to start are up and that the dollar is increasingly valueless, and that may be the other form that it takes. In other words, you can have either a hyperinflation in prices or a collapse in the value of the dollar. And right now, the dollar is collapsing against virtually every, every currency in the globe. This system is dead, and it ain't coming back. You know, we have no industry any longer. We have no manufacturing any longer. We have no machine tool capability. The aerospace industry is being taken down. There is nothing, and there's a lot of illusion about this, but there is no economic activity uh, relative to the size of the U.S. economy and the population. And this is now a global reality. Europe is shutting down under the Euro regime. And what's the threat to a place like China? That there's, there, there's no export market. They've based themselves on cheap labor and it doesn't work. This is all completely insane. We've reduced the productive capability of the planet as a whole. We've destroyed the advanced sector. We've destroyed Europe. We've destroyed the automobile sector in the United States. We've destroyed the level of skilled labor. And we exported it to a cheap labor market. But what was the problem? We've underpaid China in particular, but also Indonesia, Malaysia, Mexico, we underpaid them. So they, are, they have not been able to, re, to bring their population up to a standard of living that would sustain a new level of labor skill, a new le a level of productivity that could work on advanced scientific uh, equipment. So China is in deep trouble in the sense that they got about, eight, you know, some of this you've got to let the magnitude sink in. China is 1.3 or 1.4 billion people. Now, let's say they have 400 million people in, uh, uh, that have benefited from the economic growth. That's a rough figure. There's about eight or 900 million people in China who live in villages, where the average equivalent income is a buck a day. Now, what does it take to raise eight or 900 million people? to some modest standard of living. Or take India, the same thing, 700 million people who live in poverty. On the other hand, these are nations that are committed to growth, that are committed to resolving the problem of poverty, that want their nations to develop. Now, what are we seeing? What we're really seeing, the, the, the head that this is coming to, and this is the main point, I want to make in terms of the uh, political situation is what we see in Copenhagen because that's relevant to what I'm going to discuss a little bit today. What's going on in Copenhagen? You have a, a meeting of whatever it is, a hundred and some odd countries. And what's the idea that's being pushed largely by the advanced sector, largely by the, uh, the financial forces that are typified by the British monarchy, by what the Queen of England said at the Commonwealth meeting in Trinidad and Tobago a couple of weeks ago. That it is our task to use the power of the Commonwealth to spread uh, you know, zero growth policies that we don't have global warming, we don't have carbon pollution and so on and so forth. This of course is the line of Prince Charles Prince Philip, but it's also the line of the large, the, the, you know, the, uh, the main financial powers, Europe, the Obama administration. The Obama administration is 100% for this, or at least the uh, Obama and the people around him. And I'll, I'll make a, 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 a quick point on that. So what are they demanding? They're demanding 20, 30, 40, 45 percent cutbacks in carbon emissions 
between now and 2020, between now and 2050, with effectively no compensation to the developing sector countries. None whatsoever. Now, of course, le leaving aside the fact that most of the science on this, this idea that it's settled science, as one guy put it, I think it was uh, a senator, Sensenbrenner, this is scientific McCarthyism. Dictatorship. Yeah, well, for most Americans, I think a good idea is McCarthyism. You can't believe this. It, 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 there's a witch hunt in scientific circles against anybody who says that, indeed, there is not global warming. If you say you're not, in fact, what are you called if you say there isn't global warming? A denier. Well, what is that supposed to evoke? Holocaust deniers. Okay. So, you know, the idea is if you don't believe in global warming, you're a Holocaust denier. Now, the truth of the matter is, if you want, okay, thanks. If you want, if you want a, uh, to know what's the ideology, the ideology of most of the environmentalists is a lot closer to the Nazis. The Nazis were nature worshipers. They came out of a movement of youth, Pure. yeah, that were nature worshipers. Aryan. Well, Aryan, but also they loved to go out and do, you know the Schwarzwald. You know Martin Heidegger, who was an ideologue of the Nazis, believed in the purity of the forests. No, no economic, no technological, no real scientific development. They were anti-science. Now, what do you have? Let me give you a, 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 the, the scandal that's breaking out. Look, and what Lynn has said about this is the, the, you have to reject the idea of overriding national sovereignty. You have to tell these people, stay out. They're, we're not going to succumb to a one world regime where orders come from a meeting in Copenhagen that tell you what economic development that you can have, what your citizenry can do. But and I, we have a very good example. There's, uh, over the last couple of days, a document was leaked, which was supposed to be the treaty agreements that were being prepared. Now, these documents demanded no compensation for third world countries in, the develop, uh, uh, you know, in exchange for uh, reducing their carbon emissions. No fine, uh, they, there was an offer of $10 billion <laughs> which you know, it really is a drop in the bucket these days for the entire developing sector. Now, on top of that, the, uh, and the, the problem that we face, look, there's tremendous pressure coming down on China, India, South Africa, the African nations to give in to this. They're being told they'll get no aid, they'll get no backup, et cetera, et cetera, if they don't go along with it. The Chinese and the Indians had agreed to form a front against this kind of policy. However, there is tremendous pressure on them, and you know, there's a sense that they have that maybe they should concede a few points and then go back home and do what they want to do. But that won't work. If the, if, if the alliance among these nations does not hold, they're going to be steamrolled into destroying their own populations. Now, lest anyone think that's an exaggeration, the United Nations Population Agency has issued its report. Now, they base this on the Optimum Population Trust, which is a British-based population study. And what do they find out? They do a cost-benefit analysis that was... Um, commissioned by the trust, and they say the best way to reduce emissions is family planning. Uh, so the cheapest way to control carbon emissions effectively is to pay for condoms. In other words, if you, if you reduce the, the level of population, that's the cheapest way to reduce carbon emissions. Now let me give you an idea of the kind of figures they come up with. 
In order to save one ton of carbon dioxide, all you need to do is spend four pounds on contraception. But a similar reduction, a similar reduction in carbon dioxide, one ton, requires eight pounds of investment in tree planting, planting, 15 pounds in wind power, 31 pounds in solar energy, and 56 pounds in hybrid vehicle technology. So condoms and contraception are 14 times more efficient than uh, you know, hybrid vehicle cars and twice as efficient as trees. Admittedly, one condom is less than a whole tree. Um, and so on. So you can reduce carbon dioxide by 34 gigatons, which I guess is 34 million tons. Billion, billion tons? Billion. Okay. Um, we're on $220 billion. The same, uh, in, 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 if you do lo low carbon technologies, it would cost you a trillion dollars. So what they say that they can achieve with just $220 billion is a reduction in the world population by 2050 of 500 million people, a half a billion. From what, so, it, is from what it is today. Okay. From, so from about six and a half billion to six billion. So an absolute cut by reduction in population. However, the real killer in this is that if we just took the population growth rates of today and projected them linearly into the future, we would get about eight and a half to nine billion people by 2050. So there's an actual idea of reducing the normal activity of the present population by three billion people. Now, this is population genocide. Okay, how do you, because look, it doesn't work this way anyway. If you are, are reducing the birth rates, what do you do? You increase the rate of elder senior citizens to younger people. You are, you're, incre you're increasing the ratio of less active people in the economy to, uh, to the more active people in the economy. You get the kind of situation you have in places like Japan, where very soon over 50% of the population will be over 65 years old. And so what is, but what happens even before that? This is what you call a dynamic. Because the level of causality isn't some simple one-to-one -one causality. As the society ages, as the productivity levels go down, the economy collapses further and further. People become susceptible to illness. Uh, pr food productivity decreases and so on and so forth. Farmers, what do we have in the farming sector in the United States? Farmers are getting older and older. So the economy actually collapses well before these projections. And that's what we face. This is an anti-human, anti-growth reality. And that's what's going on in Copenhagen. That's what all this, you know, this global warming is. That's what the whole policy is. It's a destruction of human populations. It's an anti-human policy. Look, the, the reality is that, in, that environmentalism is largely an outgrowth of pessimism, cultural pessimism. It's a hatred of human beings. It's an outgrowth of Malthusian. Malthusian, yeah. It's, it's but I'm getting it. So this is an, the, the, because where does that come from? Where does it come from? It comes from a mischaracterization of what human beings are, of what value is, or what, of what wealth is. And that's what I mean by pessimism. This is why it's so difficult, really, for people to accept. Because it's, it's taken as an axiom. It's taken as a belief. Well, Wouldn't you agree that if, the, if Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, those people back then, didn't uh, create the national park system, that they would, you know, the country would just have exploited 
all that uh, wild uh, life, wild territory, you know, and mess it all up. No, no, I don't system? believe that. I mean, that's what always happens, you know. No. Logging and, 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 and Axiom, uncontrolled. That's what always that, no. happens. Is, what did you just say? You said that's what always happens. That's an axiom. No, if, first of all, let me give you a good example of an exactly opposite uh, uh, approach, which has the same last name. And some of these things you just have to look up. I mean, I can't, we can't detail everything here. But a good example is Franklin Roosevelt versus Teddy Roosevelt. Look, the way in which the, way in which the park system, uh, what really happened with the park system under Teddy Roosevelt had nothing to do with conservation. Don't believe that Teddy Roosevelt didn't care about uh, you know, timber companies and so on and so forth. He, what, he, what really happened, and I'll, let me, I want to finish just the, the briefing part, and then I'll come. But what, what really happened? The good person to look at is Lincoln. Lincoln's view of the United States, and it was a view that included parks and development and so on and so forth, was that the United States would expand to the West. This was also John Quincy Adams' vision, that we would become a continental nation and that we would have relatively secure and peaceful borders. And that the unique character of the United States would be the development of the internal landmass, which really has, in generally, has not been done in human history. Human, humanity has generally been coastal environments. Because the, the accessible forms of transportation that were relatively cheap were seagoing. The ability to overcome frictional problems and geographical problems in land development is something that only uh, occurred in the 19th century. In fact, the biggest way to destroy things is to have an underdevelopment of technology and scientific development. Because when you, the way you overcome your requirement for wood burning, or even usage of wood or anything of those types, is you develop new resource capabilities, which means an advance in your scientific development. And so you, you, you reduce the need to use lower energy forms and so forth. So you don't burn up forests. We don't burn up forests now to get energy. So what did Roosevelt do? And this is something, Roosevelt also had a policy of protecting certain land areas for trees, for, in particular, Roosevelt was a big fan of trees, uh, Franklin. OK? And so what did he do? He incorporated the protection of forest areas with the development of infrastructure, water management, energy production. And you find in many areas where we do this, we produce more trees than existed there before. Look, you know, nature destroys all kinds of things. It, it, the idea that nature is this self-preserving mechanism is, is just not the truth about nature. Nature can be extremely destructive. You know, I always get a kick out of, uh, you know, people and their, you know, animals. Animals? The one thing you say about animals is they're animals. They kill a lot of, you know, when I grew up, one of the myths was that animals didn't kill each other like human beings do. That's not true. Animals kill members of their own species all the time. You, you want a good example? I take a good example. Take the lovely little house cat. Now, I'll give you, you take, a, you take a neighborhood with some house cats. And as the males and females intermix in a neighborhood, you usually find one or two males become dominant. And you can tell usually who the dominant males are at somewhat age, also the amount of scar tissue on their cheeks. They get big puffy cheeks because they have to fight to maintain the territory. Now, if they succeed in dominating a territory, in a change in the cat that dominates a the territory, they will eat the, kill the kittens. They'll kill all the kittens fathered by any other cat. Nice creatures. I mean, on the other hand, they're cats. So cats do what cats do. You can't really get angry at a cat for doing it. That's their nature. OK? No, it, when we do things right, 
the way Franklin Roosevelt did it or the way Lincoln envisioned it. You know, Lincoln's vision for the United States was that we would have about 500 million people by 1950, about 100 years after the Civil War. Because his view was we would have developed the western part of the United States. Let me tell you something. I have the privilege of flying over the United States. I fly back and forth uh, you know, two times a month. Okay, The United States is empty. There's nothing there. There's a few areas of population density. The west coast, the southern part of the United States, uh, the, so you know, the southern part of California, the Great Lakes, which is being depopulated, and the northeast. And all the rest is nothing. From the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, you can fly for about two and a half hours and see just about no civilization. Now that's the truth about Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was deployed to stop the internal land development of the United States. Teddy Roosevelt was, was a product of his uncle who was the head of Confederate intelligence. And that's not a connecto, he really was trained by Bullock. He was an Anglophile at the point at which the British were deployed against the development of the United States. Right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of thing you have to look at. Now, for example, what would be the quick, here's one that, you know, just slides by people. What would be the quickest, most effective way to cut global warming? If you're really worried about carbon dioxide, which of course is very good for plants, yeah, nuclear energy. Nuclear energy does not produce carbon dioxide. Now, so if you were serious, you would say, what about nuclear energy? Now, people say, well, oh, it's polluting. Well, nuclear, first of all, waste can be recycled. There are ways of dealing with the waste. You could, you could reduce it to virtually nothing through some of the more advanced technologies available to us on breeder reactors and ultimately fusion processes, number one. Number two, modern day reactors are uh, increasingly safe. And number three, the only reactors that weren't safe were the, were the Soviet reactors, which used a graphite core that nobody else used. Indeed, in the, advanced, in the western part of the world, there is not a single, including Three Mile Island, not a single nuclear accident of any serious consequence. Period. There are more people who die in coal mines every year. And I would say there's more people who die in coal mines in six months of a year in the United States than have died in all the nuclear problems that we've had in 50 years. See, and the thing that you really have to ask yourself, yeah, you have to ask yourself, is why do these beliefs exist? Because we have, and I, this is what I, I will get into, because in, particularly at the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, there was an explicit effort to undermine the conception of the human individual that was effectively bursting onto the scene. That was a potentiality. Now the truth, where do we, just to, where, where do we stand now? Look, let me give you an idea of this. We're about to enter a period where the monetary forces that are basically controlling Obama and the administration that control most of Europe are intent on implementing the most massive forms of austerity we've ever seen. That's what the health care policy is. Forget every detail of the health care policy. The essence of the health care policy is cut costs. We can't afford it. It's too expensive. People's lives are too expensive at the end of their life. And we saw this with the mammogram policy. What a bunch of bunk. And, uh, but it's to eliminate 500 billion from the health care. Total is 500, but that's what they say to start with. To start with, yeah. 
we wanted to save money on the marble thing, which is definitely necessary. Maya Wonderland died of breast cancer at 36 years of age because it did not have uh, any indication she had the kind of tumor. There is another test that's much less expensive and you do not hear about it. If you have any kind of tumor, teeny weeny one growing on your breast, they smash your breast, mm -hmm. if you've ever had one, and that will in, it actually spread the cancer. But there is something now which is a fail safe, it tells you if anything's growing in your, in your body, and it's a heat related test, which is much less expensive. Look, let, 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 let me tell you my general view. But I agree with you, they're just not um, in agreement. Yeah. They're not letting you know about that. Look, they're, they're beyond that, let me tell you something. Know. There, There's one thing here, and there, it's cut costs, cut costs, cut costs. Yeah. And people better you better get that through your head through through your heads. You know, this is what what people should smell is the idea of massive destruction of people in the third world and in the advanced sector. Because once you get on the road of cost benefit analysis and you be, really believe you can measure a human life in monetary terms, you're down the road to hell. I mean, you know, people should recognize, what was a concentration camp? They didn't just kill. A concentration camp started as a labor camp. Yes. Basically. It was cheap. It was slave labor. Well, they did these advanced tests to see how little you could feed people versus how yeah. hard you could work it was, to get the maximum. It was labor. slave labor. But worse than uh, slave labor. It, yeah, but it was slave was labor. labor. Slave, yeah, that's where it started. Slave labor, however, in some place like the USA or among the Spanish and Portuguese, they intended to keep the slaves. Right. But the Nazis decided to work them yeah. to death. But look, what happened? And then you bring in a whole new game. What happened was, uh, what they, yeah, yes, but let me tell you something. Any slave labor goes in that direction. This idea that there was better and worse slave labor. As soon as those countries reached a kind of de uh, dead end, they would have the same work them to death policy. You know, the British, for example, love to say that our colonialism was better. And the only reason their colonialism was better is they were the dominant empire in the world so they could loot some other empire to give out a few goodies to their own empire. The British financial empire ran the world. There was no other significant empire. There is no other significant empire today. It's a financial empire. It's based in London, and it's looting the global population. Now, the fact of the matter is, we've got an, an Obama presidency that is fundamentally ideologically committed, psychologically committed, to this policy to a looting policy on, on health care, to an insane environmental policy on a global scale. And in fact, Obama's ego is part of the problem. Because when he gets orders, like he did from Carter, who was the, uh, the head of the population section of the World Wildlife Fund, he said, the president should come to Copenhagen, because that's the strength that we need to push this policy through. When he gets directions from Tony Blair on health care, on Afghanistan, from Gordon Brown, this president believes that he, he's going to improve his global image by adhering to these policies, by actually exp uh, you know, acting for these policies. Now, what, what we can expect, and what Lynn said this morning, is over the next two to four weeks, you can expect some of the worst policy initiatives you've ever seen. Because these, there is a certain desperation to impose these policies globally. And it's not a local problem. There is a global physical economic breakdown, which is going on now. And there's no local or regional problem that's worth focusing on. There's no local problem that you can solve. We've got to address this from the standpoint of global economic policy. What, what Lynn is, uh, pro has acted on is we now have, for example, a certain amount of collaboration between the Russians and the Chinese. We saw that in the middle of October. 
And that has changed the direction of their policy and some other policy in the ensuing period. There is, a, there is the idea of developing northeast Siberia jointly with the Chinese. There's offers for development in Southeast Asia. There's been a nuclear deal between the Indians and the Russians. All these are, should be seen as motions, as processes. In and of themselves, if we stop today, they wouldn't mean much. But if they go on, if they are acted on as policy, they represent the direction that the globe could go, in effect, as a systemic change out of the death of the present system. You, you know, in a sense, we're giving birth to a new set of arrangements amongst nations, which are oriented to real physical economic development and the real increase in the living standard and productivity of populations as a response to the death of this system. And the essence of it is a different concept of human nature a different concept of what human beings are. That's, where, that, that's the only uh, direction that means anything of, 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 of value. We see this uh, uh, coming, it's partly coming in reaction to Copenhagen. Because this stuff, this environmentalism, look, I saw this stuff. And this may be a good way, way to segue into um, uh, what I want to get at in the class a little bit. And as I say, this is just a, we're just pinch hitting here. Next week, by the way, Jerry Rose, I would advise people to come, is going to do something on Shakespeare and the role of classical art in the development of, of human civilization and science. But look, you know, I think a, a good way to look at this OK, yeah, the, the other thing we can, I can say about Obama is, look, one, one of the things to look for is there's probably going to be a purge of the administration. Because right now, the administration has elements in it that are open to Lynn's ideas, that are in dialogue with Lynn. Now, at the point at which Obama thinks he's got to really dance to the tune of the, uh, of, of the British or the financial oligarchy, which it's not really England, it's, you know, then he will probably those, the gang of four so-called, Axelrod, Jarrett, uh, Rahm Emanuel, and, and Obama himself, are prepared to dump some of the people that they compromised with. And that's where we're headed. The political situation on a global scale is headed to a sharp set of breaks. And a lot depends now on our ability to take the United States and in effect, take it out from under the control of Obama and the core people around him. Now, that's one of the reasons that we've launched uh, this uh, LaRouche Youth Movement congressional campaigns. Some of you may know, we, we have three campaigns. One is we're running against Bonnie Flank up in uh, <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> Hebrew, you know, Hebrew National has declared him unkosher. In fact, the, the, the Hebrew National advertisement is now that, you know, hot dogs are from heaven and Barney Flank is from Satan. But the uh, <laughs> Barney Flank is unapproved. The uh, yeah. So the um, so you know we're running uh, Rachel Brown against uh, Barney Frank. Actually, I, the, the, I, there's a cartoon that we're doing, but I don't do it that well, which has Elmer Fudd talking to a ta dining table. <laughs> <laughs> and at a certain point, the dining room table looks up at Elmer Fudd and says uh, something like, you're no Barney Frank. But anyway, the, uh, um, so we also have uh, Summer Shields. Some of you uh, saw Sky here. His brother is running against uh, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, right? Uh, you know, somebody said, anyway. Uh, so, you know, the, the, big, the, the big thing about P Pelosi is, is whether she'll be able to smile or not. But anyway. 
What? Uh, um, are there many places in the world where the financial breakdown is better? No. Or is it the same it's a global financial breakdown. There is no safe haven. There is nowhere to put your money. And, and okay. They have a secret account in Cayman Islands. Even that won't last. Oh, you have to give it to the So, so we're going to be running, and the, the other, so we're running against Nancy. So these are look, these are two people, Barney Frank and Nancy Pelosi. When Lynn put forward the homeowners, the Bank Protection Act, they were two of the main people who opposed it. And now, what do you have? You, know, you realize you have a total of eight million homes that have been in foreclosure. And, and between one and a half and two million were actually repossessed since Lynn's call. It's depression levels. So we're running, and we're also running an interesting campaign in Texas uh, in the district that houses NASA against a less well known figure, a guy named Pete Olson. But what's important about it is look, these are not three congressional campaigns in the sense of local campaigns, these are three campaigns that are meant to be exemplary of a national policy campaign. In other words, these, are the, these policies are the policies that the Congress should be imposing on the presidency. <coughs> that the Congress is now should be typified by these three individuals. Because what we're really running, we're in a presidential system. We're running to control the presidency. Not to get some vote in Congress, per se. That's the way the Congress really works. That's the way the constitutional system works. Now, hmm? well, you run a national policy campaign. And what you're supposed to do is raise those policy principles in the debate in Congress as the alternative to what the president is doing. And the Congress has the ability to check the presidency. They don't. They don't have any new. They, they basically operate within the po right now. The only policies that are being put forward are coming from the presidency. They're not acting to put anything forward. They're not acting to initiate a debate in the United States. I think the problem is for everything that Obama talked about, the unitary executive is being continued where the president basically goes to Congress and says, you have a responsibility to do what I want, and Congress is marching forward. Well, because all what they, but they, they don't have the idea of themselves as putting forth any different policy. They don't have the courage to fight it. Many of them don't want to fight it. They have the same policy. That's true. But those that do have a different policy effectively think you have to argue within the confines of the terms of debate that have already been set forward. A good example is environmentalism. Even the neocons think you have to give in on environmentalism, that you have to make some concession. And indeed, you don't. You have to establish an entirely different policy. Huh? Yeah, a new idea. We have to say monetarism stinks. The Federal Reserve stinks. Bernanke should be out. That's what I mean. And if you have people who, instead of looking at simply representing the interest of a district in, the, in, in a point of fundamental political crisis, then they can act from the body of the Congress to raise principles of debate. And that's what you want to do. So these are going to be national campaigns. And in fa the fact, I think, that they're represented by youth is not unimportant. The question is, what's the future of the country? Who's going to be here 50 or 60 years from now? Who do, what's the vision of where we're going? Look, l let me make a point, which will get me into, is a good way maybe to get into where we should head on. Because what I want to get at is, what are the beliefs that people have? Why is it that virtually every economist in the country is an idiot? I mean, somebody should ask the question, how is it that virtually every economist, so-called, from Paul Krugman to Joe Stiglitz to you know, Ben Bernanke to, what's his name, Paulson, that every one of them missed this crisis. And they're still missing it. 
They're telling you there's a recovery when there's no recovery. There's no growth in the economy. There's no jobs. There's no new manufacturing. There's no new construction. There's no new investment in science and technology. And they say there's a recovery because the financial instruments are being propped up by the bailout. And so there's a recovery on Wall Street. Well, they caused it. I mean, they, they were part of it. So they're not going to. No, but what about everybody else? I know your question is rhetorical, but um, I think that it's necessary to be positive. And I think that they're not going to say there isn't a recovery because, you know, people are going to go jump off bridges. And then we're going to have a lot of people in hospitals. And they're going to jump off bridges people. if they're told lies that don't work. Exactly. But I think it's necessary to be positive. No, it's never necessary to lie to people. I don't care. We're positive. We're positive in the sense that we have a solution. We know what can be done. The Russians and the Chinese are moving. We have a plan to put people to work in decent infrastructure developing jobs. We can take the youth and get them off the unemployment rolls. We can do what Franklin Roosevelt did. He did it. Right? So there's no, look, this idea that you manipulate perception is part of the problem. Right. But by you saying that this is dead, that there's no. You got to tell people the truth. Right. And they don't believe Then as long, I'm not telling them that there's a dead end. I'm saying you got to get out of making mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. Don't listen to people who have misled you. Okay. That's the basic idea. So we're positive. I like we can. One of the things you'll get, one of the things you'll get when the in the class that's done in, in January, uh, is oh, sh hey, okay, let's chill a little bit, okay. The uh, one of the things. I'm used to California crowds. They're usually. They don't say anything. They just leave. You know. My favorite joke about California crowds is that. You know, how many people here have, have any idea of baseball terminology? Okay, you know, the, the typical LA crowd, they come in the third inning and they leave in the seventh inning because they want to beat the traffic. <laughs> Except what happened now is all the traffic is in the third inning and the seventh inning because everybody leaves. They got to, you know, get on the highway. It's not like a New York crowd, okay, I'll tell you. It's, it's interesting to see the differences. The, um, but look, I, what I want to get at is, is what makes LaRouche kind of more unique. And what a lot of people, look, LaRouche is a, the leading economist of, in the, of the world right now. He's the only, there's no one else who's understood what's going on in the economy. But I think deeper than that, why? Is it because he's some kind of great statistician, some great mathematician? No, exactly the opposite. The reason Lynn is the, has been the leading forecaster as an economist is because Lynn is a, 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 a philosophical thinker. It's because of Lynn's epistemology, his philosophy, his outlook on human nature. And I tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll bring a, a point to bear here, you know, because you know, uh, Lynn has made a great deal about the failings of the boomer generation. That's the generation, I'm one of the older members of the boomer generation. Uh, this is the post-World War II baby boom, okay? And, you know, some, I think, you know, the question is, well, what, what is it? What happened? Now, there's a long story to it, but it isn't really that long of a story, <laughs> okay? You know, Roosevelt died on April the 12th in 1945. Roosevelt was a, what was unique about Franklin Roosevelt is that precisely when he came in in the Depression, he represented a, what you might call an American system outlook. He had studied Hamilton. His great-great-grandfather was a collaborator of Hamilton. And he, he brought in American system policies. And what did that mean? It mean you know, if, if you read both Roosevelt and Lincoln, you find something out. Both of them were very clear. The United States is neither a capitalist 
nor a socialist or communist nation. The American system is a unique system. And both of them make it clear that the development of the productive skills and intellectual skills or intellectual development of the population, of the labor force, the development of the creative powers of the citizenry of the United States is the essential mission of the United States. That's what a nation state is. That's what uh, is unique about the American Revolution and the American Constitution. And that's what Lincoln and Roosevelt represented. The idea, take the uh, preamble of the Constitution. Now, properly understood, the preamble of the Constitution is a profound insight into this the idea of a principle that guides a social formation, that guides a political institution. And it's as much a physical principle as gravity. Because what does the preamble say? And the, I, as far as I'm concerned, the essence of the preamble is embodied in one word, posterity. In order to form a more perfect union, a more perfect union. Think about that. What does it mean to be more perfect? You're either perfect or you're not. No, because it means that it gives you an idea of what perfection is. Perfection is not a fixed condition. Perfection is a state of development, a state of constant improvement. This is what this harks back to Plato. There is no such thing as a fixed dead state which is perfect, which has all the best qualities of it in it. Well, would you say that this administration is trying to destroy all that? Yeah, that's what we're saying, sure. Yeah, but, I, but I'm not... I, well, but I'm, I'm worried about something else. I'm worried about the American population that doesn't understand how to deal with it. Okay? Remember, we voted for all these people. I, I'm not that impressed with the neocons. You know, we, I'm not impressed with the opposite that we had in George Bush. Okay? Uh, isn't it the office of the presidency? Isn't, isn't it the office of the presidency that's supposed to set this right? With huh? the, isn't, isn't it the office of the presidency supposed to set this right with the, uh, the influence of the citizenry have yeah, it, ultimately the office of the presidency, but you have to control the presidency. And you have to have the ideas that the population is going to put forward. Who's going to do the checks and balances in the presidency or the force and enforce? You have a presidential institution. We have people in the presidency. The executive branch is hundreds and hundreds of people. It includes the Treasury Department, the State Department. It includes the intelligence sectors, the security sectors. So if we overrun by the evil empire, if you will, the monetary system, it should be checks and balances in the presidency to yeah, make it right. But it's, it's the citizenry that demands the policy. That's us. Yeah, that's right. Okay, there's no deus ex machina here. All right? So we, here's what we have to do. We have to know things. Now I'll give you an example. Look, look at what happened. Look at what happened after World War II. You had, you had the rise of existentialism, the rise of positivism, and insane pessimism about humanity. Everybody thinks, what do people think of when they think of a human being? They think of a, a, human beings are waste producers. They consume things and they produce waste. Now, you know, in, 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 under certain circumstances, you can be reduced to that. But human beings are not consumers. Human beings are uniquely characterized as social beings, as a species that transforms its relationship to nature. There is no fixed relationship that human beings have to nature. We are inside of the universe. First of all, keep in mind, the way in which most people look at human beings is it's as though we came from another universe, let alone another planet and we're messing up the universe. We kind of 
pollute, we screw things up, we make animals go extinct, we do all kinds of horrible things to the universe. Except there's a problem here, there's a dilemma, a paradox. The universe produced us. Therefore, if we're destructive toward the universe, it's the universe destroying itself. So ironically enough, if you have a pessimistic view of human beings, fundamentally, whether you like it or not, you have a pessimistic view of the universe. And you know, this is tied to the idea that the universe is indeed running down. The universe is entropic. It's headed toward heat death. Now what's the reality? The universe produced us. Therefore, the universe is not entropic. The universe, in fact, in its fundamental character, is anti-entropic. That is, the universe produces ever-increasing forms of development, including intelligence, including creativity, not just knowledge. Knowledge itself is just a fixed amount of data. It's real creativity. In other words, what we produce in human beings is the ability to generate ideas that give us a deeper insight into the way the world works, into the forces that control the world. And therefore, we begin to be able to do things in the universe that could not be done without those scientific, without those breakthroughs in knowledge, in cognition, in intelligence. I mean, for example, the control, for example, uh, the use of fossil fuels. See, you had a, how, what, how do people think about resources? This is going to be a fundamental question in terms of the four powers agreement that Lynn is talking about. How do people think of resources? Uh, you know, oil in, the, in your backyard a few hundred years ago impoverished you. If you had oil on your land, that was bad. It meant your land was unproductive. Somehow in the late 19th century, if you had oil in your backyard, you were rich. Now what was the difference? Was it a monetary value attached to these things? Not really. Science, no. Science developed the ability to use fossil fuels. We had a deeper comprehension of certain processes. We had the ability to create steam engines. And so we were able to increase our power over nature. And each one of these increases involves an increase in what Lynn calls the energy flux density. In other words, you're able to take forms of heat and concentrate them. And in concentrating them, you're changing your relationship to certain parts of nature. And it goes beyond the fact that you produce something. In fact, what happens? We actually change what we experience. We change what we know. For example, atomic events didn't exist to the knowledge of human beings hundreds of years ago. Our ability to affect molecular and then atomic events didn't exist. It was the increase of our knowledge that opened up areas of activity that allowed us to discover principles that operate at the atomic level. Things that were not seen and still aren't seen to this day in any direct sense. So there's a, a, a creative development in the ideas that govern human activity. And this, this expands our power and our control over nature, and it expands the availability of that knowledge to society as a whole. It changes the way infants grow up. An infant today, a child today, at least potentially, has control over events around him and powers around him that a child did not have 500 years ago. So the child's access and ideas about what nature is like is different. For example, electricity. 
or even fire in different ways, but electricity. Electricity to the extent it existed as an event in nature hundreds of years ago was dangerous. Lightning, other forms of uh, natural electrical events were bad. We have no control over them. You know, I think uh, Lynn often makes the point about fire. There's good reason to believe that indeed human use of fire, uh, the, the, the cases that I know, I know of, Lynn may know of others, go back about 100,000 years where fire is actually used to change our ability to make tools. We move from stone tool making to heating uh, some of the material, which gives us the ability to shape it, sharpen it, create all kinds of new, in, new tools that didn't exist before then, which gave a tremendous advantage to the human population. But that use of fire probably goes back between one and two million years. Now think of what fire is. The, the, the idea that human beings would use a fireplace or control fire and use that to control their environment, not just as security, but even, for example, things like cooking. I mean, cooking is an outcome of energy flux density. In other words, to the degree all of a sudden you're controlling fire, you're able to break down the chemical makeup of what you're eating. And making, therefore, you make it available to a human digestive system which normally couldn't digest that or would need a much bigger digestive apparatus. So the entire history of the human species as it has developed is predicated on the increasing expansion of human creative uh, uh, activity which expands our knowledge and control over the universe. Without that, we don't exist. But with that, we are completely different than any other animal in the world. No other animal transmits ideas. No other animal has culture and history. Now, to come back to the idea about the Constitution, what does the Constitution say? What is the real mission of a nation? It's not just to protect its population. That's a lower level. It's to guarantee that as a citizen, you have a certain quality of immortality. Your activity today will survive in some form as a contribution to the changes in society 50 and 100 years from now which will guarantee that the children born then have a future of 50 to 100 years beyond them. So as a, the idea is that the nation guarantees or protects your personal sense of identity as a contributor that you know of today. In fact, one of the things that Lynn says in, his, in this document that he has is that the future exists now, and therefore it's changeable. We can know what the future is going to be headed for, and on the basis of where, knowing where we're headed, we can change that direction. We can change the future because the future, in principle, exists as a consequence of our activities today. The nation state has as its mission, as understood by the, you know, in one sense, the only nation that exists is a fully developed nation state, as, or not fully developed, but almost fully developed. The American Constitution, the American Revolution. The principle in the Constitution is that the nation exists so that you may make a contribution to the future, not so that you may get something today. The general welfare principle is not a principle of you get something from the, uh, from the government. The general welfare principle is that the nation state guarantees your identity into the future, that what you do today will survive and contribute to a developing nation in the future, and one that has a positive relationship to other nations. So the whole idea is it's future-oriented, it's development-oriented. 
and that the value in the economy is measured only in terms of the expanded development of the powers of the population, the, of the labor force. That means that not only do you have scientific development, but you have a level of education and culture that's required so that the future generations can act on that advanced scientific capability. You can't take a tractor and dump it into a village in Kenya and say, here, use it. You gotta have a population that's capable of using it. Now that doesn't mean don't give them the tractor. It means develop their capability of using it. That's what our mission as a nation is. That's how we should be dealing with the question of third world development. Not telling people in the third world, you should emit less carbon dioxide. You know, fundamentally it's disgusting. Okay? The idea of telling people not to develop, not to grow, because you know, we grew and uh, you know, we found we polluted too much, so you guys should live in poverty. It's a, it's a more pristine state. Right. Now, yeah. Now, wh where does this where does this whole idea of entropy come from? Where is this whole idea of no growth, limited growth? Where does it come from? It doesn't come from science. It comes from it, a well, it comes in part from a financial oligarchy, but it comes from an ideology. It comes from an epistemology that's grounded in the idea that we want short-term quick results with, big, with easy, relatively easy answers. It's really grounded in an idea that Lynn has gone after extensively most of his life. It's grounded in an idea that knowledge is in a sense fixed. That there's a fixed form of axiomatic knowledge that's available. For example, how many people think, some of you may have know, but What's your idea of knowing something? Is that you have a definite 100% answer to a question? And for example, the, the model that's taken for knowledge for many people is Euclidean geometry. We have an axiom, we have a set of axioms, and we, can, we have a deductive proof. We have a certain rules of deduction, and that's what knowledge is. And anything else is not knowledge. Anything else is not truth. What's a standard of truth? I have a 100% true statement. I can prove it logically. And of course, this is the standard that, for example, applies in economics today. What is behavior, what is uh, game theory economics? What's Adam Smith's view of economics? You, you, you take a certain number of axiomatic truths, and what's one of the axioms? Human beings don't know anything for certain. All human beings can do, if they think they know something, they're going to mess it up. Therefore, they should stay away from it. What we do know is that human beings like pain, like pleasure, and hate pain. And therefore, they will evaluate things that they like at a higher monetary value. So if you control what produces pleasure in somebody, or the supply, you can control the price. But if people really want it, and you want to sell it, and so on and so forth. The market of pleasure and pain, of pluses and minuses, will determine the value of commodities in an economy. And the problem is, if you try to intervene with knowledge about the future, or knowledge about what we need to do to improve human existence, you're going to mess everything up. Human intervention is a problem. Therefore, is it ever the case that you're trying to improve human knowledge? Is, it, is there any effort in the economic principles of this outlook that says, let's improve human knowledge? No. 
There's no real value in it. You might want to improve skills in the sense of somebody who's capable of producing something. But do you ever really want to improve human knowledge? Do you ever want to explore the universe? No. A good example is the space program. This is what the whole point, yeah, you have a question? Entropy means basically heat, uh, the, the, when, when you do work, there's a certain amount of loss of heat. In other words, a certain amount of the energy becomes randomized. It becomes uh, uh, dissipated in a, in a manner that you can't recapture. That's entropy. When entropy goes up, the amount of randomization of, of energy or other or, uh, in the universe is randomized and it can't be recaptured. So a high rate of entropy means a lot of heat that's unusable for work, to do any work. Or put it this way, it takes you more and more to recapture the heat or the energy that you need to do the work. So you're expending more and more to get less and less. So the general character of the universe is, you could, is your ability to do work to transform the universe is decreasing. Okay? See law of thermodynamics, so number one, you can't win. Number two, you can't even break even. And number three, you can't get out of the game. Something like that, yeah. Not a bad way to look at it. All right? Now, so the, the rea what's the reality? The reality is that human knowledge, the standard of human knowledge, is creative discovery. And creative discovery is not an absolutely 100% deductive certain process. Now, one of the interesting things that, that to look at, and I'm just going to reference, one of the interesting things to look at is not only was there a deployment against the, uh, Lincoln and the, uh, the victory of the Union in the Civil War. But indeed, at the, by the second half of the 19th century, I would argue, and I think Lynn sir indicates, that by the second half of the, of the 19th century, there's effectively an effort, and some of it by people who weren't the worst. That's one of the people, one of the points that Lynn makes, to undermine any idea of a creative standard of development and truth. Discovery. Now, on the, on the side of the, of, of the American Revolution, and these things are intertwined. On the side of the American Revolution, uh, some of you have heard this, but some may, may, may not have, the, 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 uh, the British Empire, up until the, end, up until the Civil War, still had certain ideas of destroying the United States by active intervention. I mean, there's the War of 1812, there was the introduction of slavery, uh, and there was the hope that the Civil War itself would divide the United States up, either by the success of the South in seceding, or it's simply the chaos of the Civil War breaking the United States up into a number of parts. And there's a number of things that people don't know about this period. For example, there was a point during the Civil War where the Northwest of the time was thinking of seceding. That it was uh, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Well, also New, New England at one point was thinking of seceding. There were all kinds of operations. Now, with the success of Lincoln, the British effectively gave this up. Moreover, after Lincoln and the development of the Transcontinental Railroad, a number of nations took up the same projects, including the Russians, the Germans, later on the Chinese, under Sun Yat-sen, about a generation later, and so on and so forth. So that by the end of the 19th century, the threat was that the, the American system would lead to a genuine development of the large part of the globe, including what we call today the Eurasian land bridge. Russia, China, the Middle East, and so on and so forth. Now, the British, under Edward VII, deployed to create World War I. 
Now I'm giving you some shorthand here, but World War I did as much to set the stage for what followed as anything else. Complete demoralization of European civilization. In some ways, when Lynn says that under the European Union, Europe is out of the equation for the moment. They don't have the ability to act as nations. They're dominated by the euro. They're dominated by London financial control. That's really an outcome of what happened in World War I, where the pessimism of the end of the 19th century and the move into World War I, the manipulation of the death of the Habsburg Empire, the death of the Ottoman Empire, into a, into a meat grinder of a war that had no purpose, none whatsoever. There were no good guys in World War I, even though we came in for the last 11 months. And we weren't good guys. We came in and uh, there was no side to come in on. It was an imperial conflict of two dying empires and uh, the hegemonic empire. And all empires operate on this kind of monetarist basis. They're not really nations. It's not the British. It's really better understood as the Venetians. The middleman, the financier. Yeah. I'm sorry, um, but I, the, in terms of the fi financial system in, in, in ownership in, in Europe and uh, England, things have changed somewhat. If there are um, scholars and politicians throughout England that are writing about the fact that there is this tremendous threat from the European Union and that it's Franco-German inspired, yeah, but, and that Brussels owns. Yeah, but Brussels is dominated, dominated by everything in England, and that they're losing their own national. Yeah. Now, there's one sense in which, if you're, it, there is such a thing as England as a nation, Scotland as a nation, Wales as a nation. They are being destroyed, but the British Empire has nothing to do with that. The British Empire is a financial empire, for which the monarchy plays a role. Now, one good example of this. It's not a Franco-German agenda. It's a financial agenda. But they're not, the Franco-Germans are not a financial power. Germany's been under the euro system since the fall of the wall. They, they were ordered to go under that to, in order to get reunification. So there is no control that they have. They're not, they're, what you've got is a global financial power. We saw this with the, 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 the recent collapse. Where is it all? It's London and Wall Street. Europe is dominated by this. Now, as the system breaks down, you're going to get all kinds of people fighting against each other. But the imperial sense, look, how did Queen Elizabeth act at Trinidad and Tobago? You know, as, as Moncton said, she was violating the constitutional monarchy. She's not supposed to do what she did. Now, Moncton may be right about that. But she wasn't acting as the Queen of England. She was acting as the empress of a financial empire. So she didn't care about the constitutional monarchy for the moment. That's how you really have to look at these things. OK? But the, now the real issue here, the real issue here is that at the end of the 19th century, the idea of an American system, what, what did I tell you the American system is? The American system is based on the idea that the development of the creative powers of labor is the core of the wealth of the country. This was Hamilton's idea. Artificial labor, the introduction of science and technology, the introduction of infrastructure, the expansion of living standards. That, was the, that is the American system. We may not operate by the American system today in large part. We've had little bits and pieces of it. That, that's what we have to return to. Now, at the same time, think about what, what the 19th century, 18th and 19th centuries were. This was where you had some of the most substantial developments and breakthroughs in science, chemistry, physics. And at the same time, you had some of the greatest cultural developments in human history. I mean, what we call classical music, most of it was created from the late 17th century to the early middle 19th century, you know, from Bach to Schubert. 
or maybe a little bit further. Look at what was going on in science and technology. I mean, chemistry didn't exist until the 18th century. A great deal of what we consider today electricity didn't exist until the 19th century. What you had, based on the kinds of developments that you saw in the United States, in Weimar, Germany, was a great flourishing of a focus on the creative powers of the human individual. It's worth noting, a lot of the great scientists of this time were, came out of generally, uh, you know, what we would call working families. Gauss, his father was a bricklayer. Riemann's father was a minister. So on and so forth. Now, what happens at the end of the 19th century is there is an explicit deployment to destroy the idea of creative human development and to attempt to reduce it to an axiomatic deductive standard that all truth had to be 100% analytic, deductive. That is, all truth had to be an axiom or like Euclid. Euclid was the model. And it's worth knowing, what was Euclid? Where did Euclid come from? Euclid is not the great figure of Greek knowledge. The Greek Renaissance occurs about 200 years before Euclid. The Greek Renaissance, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Thales, the great sculptors, the city-state of Athens under Solon. It's sixth century to the end of the fifth century into the fourth century BC. And the, you have a, 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 a continuation of a certain level of development into, the, into people like Eratosthenes you, uh, and so on. So what hap when is Euclid? If, you know, there's some questions of whether he was an individual or a collection of individuals. But when does Euclid's work come up? Euclid's work is 300 BC, roughly. Two, uh, 100 years after Socrates. Now, what does he do? If you look at what's in the Timaeus, if you look at what's in the Parmenides, on geometry, on knowledge, none of it is axiomatized. None of it is deductive. In fact, Plato's whole point is knowledge is not deductive in the Parmenides, in the Timaeus. Knowledge is a reflection of a creative innovation, a development of the ideas of the human species towards what he calls the good. And what's the good? The good is a process of ongoing development, ongoing improvement in human knowledge, deeper into nature, further out into nature. So what is Euclid? Euclid takes it and turns it upside down. He says, take the most elementary axiomatic truths and build a deductive system. Now, what do they do at the end of the 19th century? Exactly the same thing, except in a slightly different way. Because, and this is somewhat stunning to me, you have to realize that by, first of all, probably by the middle of the 18th century, in some ways maybe before then, but by the middle of the 18th century, people knew that Euclidean geometry was not accurate, did not describe physical nature. And there were serious questions about the axiomatic basis of Euclidean geometry. People like Kastner, later on Gauss. By the middle of the 19th century, there were explicitly non-Euclidean geometries. So you have to ask yourself, why was Euclid taken as a model for knowledge at the end of the 19th century? And it still exists as a somewhat of a model, where people think the most pristine form of knowing is a, a, a system of self-evident truths and everything you can deduce from that. When indeed, there are no self-evident truths. There may be things that seem uh, proper to experience and to a limited experience. What about the existence of God? Is that not a self-evident truth? 
I don't think it's self-evident. What is it? Who is he? What does he do? How does he operate? What's his nature? What's the content of being God? I mean, there is, it's not a whole lot different to ask what's the universe like and what's God like. The question is, even if you have a belief in God, the question is, what is it that he wants you to do? What's his nature? What's the nature of his creation? And what's our relationship to that creation? So you still, there's still, you still have to discover the universe that God created because that's the expression of God. Okay? It's, it's not a matter, you know, in the good sense, a decent approach is faith and works. It may, maybe faith helps, but you need works. And to, do, and to do, know what works to do, you've got to know something about what he created. It leans towards perfection. Something you, is a concept that you're supposed to strive for. But it's got to be, look, here's the thing. There is no fixed perfection. <laughs> but there, then you have to, here's, what you have to do is you have to know what it is the universe is asking of you. And to know what the universe is asking of you, you have to ask the universe certain questions. So you have to have an active and what Lynn would call a dynamic relationship to the universe. You as an individual, what's your relationship to the universe? You have to say, what is it that I know? I can, uh, what, is, what is it that I hypothesize about the universe? What is it that I suggest the universe is like that guides me to act in such a way that my action asks certain questions of the universe? And the universe as a whole acts upon me okay. and everything around me. And it's in the course of asking and answering those kinds of questions that I discover something. I'm able to conceive something that tells me what the universe is like. And then I act on that. So it's a process of constant perfection, constant development. The goal is in the immediate. In, the, in a sense, the universe, the, the, the principles that guide the universe are everywhere all the time. Our problem is to discover them. The universe never goes away. It's everywhere. Our task is to find out what changes we evoke in the universe around us based on the ideas that we have. And in a sense, you need a certain sense of mission. What, what is it for human beings? Where, where, is this, where is the human society going for the next 25 to 50 to 100 years? How do I act on that universe to either bring that about or to bring certain changes about? What discoveries do I have to make to bring those changes about? A good example, a good example, this is why Lynn is doing what he's doing now. Because I think you know, there's still more for people, and I want to uh, come back to this, uh, there's still more for people to think about. Why go to Mars? Because man's, it, it, one point of this is our mission, our existence in the universe is not limited to this planet. We're, we are human beings in the universe. If we want to discover more about the universe, we have to go out into the universe. We have to go to places where we can uh, test things and measure things that we can't measure from here. Now, ironically enough, as we discover those principles, as we challenge ourselves in that way, we create the knowledge, we create the, uh, the scientific and technological development that allows us to create the conditions on the planet Earth under which further discoveries can occur. It's a, it's a completely self-reflexive universal process. So we need, we're not going to find out what we need in terms of knowledge to create the conditions on the planet under which we can explore more, whether it's in the microcosmic or the macrocosmic, or the, or the astrophysical. So that's the idea. Human society will not develop economically 
without the kinds of challenges that the Mars Moon Project def defines for us, because we know what we need. You know, that's the point that uh, Lynn is making. We need 1G acceleration. Now, you're not going to get 1G acceleration without an entirely new propulsion system. That propulsion system is going to raise certain physical principles that are going to be applicable universally, not just to that rocket. And therefore, it's going to transform everything. And that's how human society develops. Yeah. Um, Self-reflexive. Can you go into that a little bit more? Because uh, that is counterintuitive yeah. to Rubenstein. Yeah. Um, we've grown up <coughs> believing that we live within closed systems and that life is a zero-sum game. That is, if you get yours, then i got to get less of mine. Mm -hmm. um, um, now, we've learned that there's such a thing as anti-entropy, or some people call it negative entropy. But what is entropy, and what is the you know, self-reflexive process? You're talking about, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that, that, that it's possible for real wealth to be created out of nothing. Yeah. Well, real wealth is, in, in a material sense, it is nothing. It's human knowledge. It's human creative capacity that changes what we can do with nature. Now, one way to look at this is a little bit different. So how, is, how is human knowledge self-reflexive? Well, a good example is look at the things that we don't experience, that we have no sensory experience of. Look at the astrophysical and look at the subatomic. We have an, we, we're, we're looking at something that was never available to human experience before based on certain scientific development. So if we have electron microscopes or more powerful telescopes or infrared telescopes, et cetera, we have a way of uh, experimenting on things that we never had available to our experience before. In doing that, we open up realms of power to human existence that didn't exist before. So now we've changed the universe that we live in. We didn't know that these doors to these rooms existed. At a certain point, by creating a different kind of light, we see doors that didn't exist before. And so we open them up, and we find out parts of the universe that, weren't, that we didn't know existed. But they were, always, they were there. And there are, this now allows us to discover principles that we couldn't discover before because we didn't have the means to even experience it. So now what have we done? We now have a whole, we're now outside of sense perception. We're using different means to deal with it. We're using different kinds of measurements. I mean, one funny example, you know, which maybe is going to help, but an example. Look, we, there's a lot we don't know about the solar system. We don't know how the asteroid belt really works. We don't know why it's there. We don't know what it does. Now, there's a good chance that a substantial part of the asteroid belt is invisible to us because they don't, it, there's not enough reflected light for us to see them, even though they may be substantial objects. So now we've got this infrared telescope we're sending out there. I think it's going up. Maybe it's going up already. It's going up soon which will probably allow us to see, some people think, 50% more asteroids. Now, if that's true, we're going to get a whole different idea what the asteroid belt is like. Therefore, we're going to get a whole different idea of certain aspects of the solar system. Just like we're learning all kinds of things about the solar system now. For example, how is water on the moon? OK, and what are we going to do about that? What about water on Mars? We know very little about Venus because it's so densely clouded. Probably too many. Maybe there's a lot of people there breathing sulfur dioxide. Cats. OK. Cows. Cows, I don't know. Right? OK. Now, but look, I want to get back to this point because 
the, the reality is at the end of the 19th century, a program was put forward that was based on the idea that all knowledge must be 100% certain deductive knowledge. Now, here's the interesting thing that happened, and then I'll come back to something. There's an interesting little paradox here. Because if all knowledge has to be 100% deductive in order for us to know that it's true, but we don't know the axioms because, you know, Euclid's axioms aren't obvious anymore. What are the axioms of geometry? Well, people like David Hilbert said, well, we don't know the axioms of geometry. But what we do know is the formal structure of an axiomatic system. So we could treat the axioms of Euclid and we could put anything in we want. You can use points, lines, and surfaces, or you could use cats, dogs, and goats. Because the system is formally coherent. And what we, therefore, what we're really looking at when we talk about truth is simply the formal internal coherence of a, uh, of a deductive structure. Now, people may think, well, this is a little esoteric. This is how much of your life runs right now. You know, there's, there comes a point where people have to know things that they think are just the area for, you know, academics or people with PhDs. Well, you know what Lynn calls PhDs? Piled higher and deeper. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, because these are the things, this is the outlook of the economists who run the economy. This is Bernanke's outlook. It's Paulson's outlook. They were raised on game theory. They were raised on market analysis. Why do you think they say, well, you know, derivatives are good because it spreads the risk? <laughs> okay? It spread the risk through the whole economy. Okay? Because that's the, the, that's the axiomatic model that they're working on. And they believe it's not the content of the system. It's the structure of the system. It's the formal structure. Now, I'll give you an idea of what this conflict was since time went a little faster than I thought. Um, I think you, some of you got this. Yeah. On the hypotheses which lie at the foundation of geometry. Now, there's two sections in here which Lynn has made. Um, yeah. I'm going to start in the middle of the paragraph two there. A necessary sequel of this is that the propositions of geometry are not derivable from general concepts of quantity, but that those properties by which space is distinguished from other conceivable triply extended magnitudes can be gathered only from experience. There arises from this the problem of searching out the simplest facts by which the metric relations of space can be determined a problem which in the nature of things is not quite definite. For several symptoms, simple facts can be stated which would suffice for determining the metric relations of space. The most important for present purposes is that laid down for foundations by Euclid. These facts are, like all facts, not necessarily, not necessary, but of a merely empirical certainty. They are hypotheses. One may therefore inquire into their probability which is truly very great within the bounds of observation, and thereafter decide concerning the admissibility of protracting them outside the limits of observation, not only toward the immeasurably large, but also toward the immeasurably small. Now, what, what Riemann is saying there is revolutionary for his time and revolutionary for our time. He's saying that, look, within normal experience, you can use Euclid's axioms, and they may extend fairly broadly, but as you get to the extremes of, human, of the universe, as you get to the astronomically large or the atomically small, those same rules are not going to hold, which means that those axioms are not true of the universe. 
And as we deal with more and more of this, what does he then say at the end? Oops. He says, a decision, the question of the validity of the postulates of geometry in the indefinitely small is involved in the question concerning the ultimate basis of relations of size and space. In connection with this question, we may well be assigned to the philosophy of space. The above remark is applicable, namely that while in a discrete manifold, the principle of metric relations is implicit, this is in a, a manifold that's already marked off, it must come from somewhere else in the case of a continuous manifold. Either then the actual things forming the groundwork of a space must constitute a discrete manifold or else the basis of metric relations must be sought for outside that actuality in the colligating forces that operate upon it. In other words, in a continuous manifold, like normal manifolds, it's the physical forces that determine the geometry. Geometry is not something that deals with an empty, pre-existing thing called space. Geometry is something that is physical, that represents the physical forces that determine the pathways of action in a space, or in the universe, not a space. This, by the way, goes to why Riemann was, was what Einstein turned to. Now then, Riemann concludes, a decision upon these questions Wait a minute. Can be found only by starting from the structure of phenomena that has been approved in experience hitherto, for which Newton laid the foundation. And by modifying this structure gradually under the compulsion of facts, which it cannot explain. So it moves from Newton. Such investigations as start out, like this present one, from general notions, can promote only the purpose that this task shall not be hindered by too restricted conceptions and that progress in perceiving the connection of things shall not be obstructed by the prejudices of tradition. Euclidianism, Newtonianism. This path leads out of the domain of another scientist, out into the domain of another science, into the realm of physics, into which the nature of this present occasion forbids us to penetrate. So what does Riemann say? We have to move to physics, which is not mathematics or geometry. We have to move to the actual world in which human beings act experimentally upon the universe based on certain hypotheses. And that in a sense, even geometry is a process of ongoing discovery. Now what this means, because the reality is if you live in a Euclidean world of axioms and deductions or simply formal systems, and I'll, I'll you know, then you live in an entropic world. It's a world that's complete. Could you repeat what you just said? If you live in a Euclidean world where it's just fixed axioms and deductions, and you assume that's a complete description of the world, even of the space of the world, or if you assume that it's only a formal system, that such that the de deductive rules, the deductive principles govern the interactions, then you exist in a dead universe, in an entropic universe. You exist in a universe that is fixed in its totality of action as a potential. And in a sense, the entire universe is already complete in front of you. Yeah, same thing. Look, computers there's a virtue, computers come out of this, but in a very strange way. In a very strange way. Uh, you know, uh, here's one for people to chew on. Computers really come out of the proof that formal systems are incomplete and, 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 uh, and cannot make a decision, or cannot make all decisions. In other words, two things are proven in the 1930s by two rather funny guys. One, Girdle, who's an interesting character, who like a lot of people, is driven somewhat crazy at the end of his life, who proves that formal deductive systems are, if they're consistent, are incomplete. 
you can't prove all the truths, but you can know things are true. You can't prove them. Alan Turing, who's considered the father of the modern computer, who is really a crazy guy, uh, proved that the computers cannot decide whether or not a question is provable. Now, in the course of developing those two proofs, Gödel's, in Gödel's case, recursive function theory, and in Turing's case, uh, certain computer languages, or what became computer languages. In the course of those two proofs, they established the basis uh, for the computer languages that you use to get machines to talk to themselves or to, to describe what they're going to do. So it's a very ironic thing because these guys are, in, in Gödel's case, he's actually proving the limits of formal systems. And indeed, this was a big shock. I'll give you an example. A David Hilbert, who put forward the program of proving the consistency, the completeness, and the decidability through deductive means, gave his last speech a day before Gödel, Gödel's proof came out. <laughs> and he lived about another 10 years, and there wasn't, he basically, now partly, I'll give him credit, partly I think he was shocked by the Gödel proof, because it really meant the end of his program. <laughs> Secondly, he was living under Nazism, and most of the people at Gödel were either Jewish or half Jewish or married to a Jew, and the whole Gödel mathematics department fell apart. So he was demoralized, and he had also been part of a program that was undoable. Because Hilbert's flaw, as Lynn put it, Hilbert was a talented guy. He was a talented mathematician. But he believed that you could solve, the, the, that you could create a formal deductive set of systems that were internally consistent and complete, that proved themselves. And indeed, that program was undoable. He was wrong. He was wrong even about Mathematics as created by human beings. But this is why Lynn makes the point. Mathematics is deadly. All creativity, all discovery comes out of something that is akin to poetic or musical composition, musical creativity. And that's the root of scientific creativity. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, is it fair to say uh, with the system that you're talking about that it denotes the absence of uh, growth pretty much? Yeah. It doesn't allow for development, not just growth. You, think I, I always, you always want to push it a little bit further. It's growth, but it's growth of a particular kind. It's the ability to change the entire system, to change the principles that govern your, uh, the way in which you're able to act. It seems like what you were talking about with the Euclidean axioms and so forth in terms of this dead fixed system, it's also the basis for where we get this idea of, well, if man, you know, man yeah. is basically a blight, we destroy well, ourselves, nature's what is it? Look, If you think knowledge is fixed and complete, then what the hell are we doing here? It's over. You, you end up with existentialism. I mean, what's the stench of existentialism? Well, but the, the real stench of existentialism, the real stench of existentialism is that what is it? What characterizes human beings is self-awareness. We're conscious of ourselves. Animals are not. Now, what does the existentialist say? From Nietzsche to Sartre, knowledge, your self-consciousness is painful. Why? What are you self-conscious of? Because you live in a limited universe. You're purposeless. You're, you're, yeah, well, you're just here. There's nothing you can do. You're just aware of your existence. Right? Yeah. Right? You're just here. You have no purpose. You have no mission. There's nothing you can develop. You're just conscious of the fact that you exist. Therefore, to the existentialist, existence is a pain. <laughs> and look, this is not a joke. Why do you think Sartre's book is called Nausea? You know, the experience in Sartre's book is he's looking at a tree. And he begins to think about what is the essence of the tree. And the tree begins to dissolve, and he gets nauseous. Because the consciousness of his own awareness makes him nauseous. It makes him think about things that he can't answer. 
It makes him dizzy. So the existential phenomena of the post-World War II era is just a, it's, I mean, positivism is not much different. The positivist just doesn't bother to get nauseous. He says, well, there's nothing else you can know. You can't talk about metaphysical things. All metaphysics, to talk about the soul is meaningless. Talk about the universe is meaningless. I'm sorry. Can you, can you tell me what, what exactly is metaphysics mean? Metaphysics means what it says. It's above the simple physical experience. So it's, it, metaphysics is the discussion of the universal principles that govern the uh, activity. I mean, all metaphysical ideas are real. It's really what drives human existence. It, we can debate them. But it means that it's above sense experience. It's above the immediate. It's not a concatenation of physical experiences and certain rules that bind them together. Why do they call it positivism? It, I don't know, because it's negative. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I think it just comes from the, from the idea Positivism says everything is based on experience and logical rules. Or at least it's logical. Positivism itself, in, this, in, the, in its 19th century version, says everything is based on experience. And you just sum up the experiences. August Comte, uh, later on Mach. So I, I, I think the word positivism comes from some idea about experience. Okay? Logical positivism, which is the 20th century version, says all you can know is the bare bones of experience, literal data. Later, this becomes information theory. And the rules by which we connect those experiences logically, inductively or deductively. And what they argue, it's somewhat of a linguistic philosophy. Their argument is anything, no, just let anything about language. <laughs> the, uh, what they argue is, that anything that is, you cannot express as an experience connected by a logical string of deductions is nonsense. It's meaningless. All meaning is associated with direct experience and the deductive or inductive relationship amongst those experiences, sentences constructed on those experiences. So everything else is meaningless. Like the way they would deal with something like God, meaningless. The universe, meaningless. So the soul, meaningless. The personality, meaningless. But by the way, this is largely the philosophical outlook of modern economic theory. John Maynard Keynes, the apostles at Cambridge. These guys were essentially positivists in different, maybe slightly different variations on the theme. Yeah. Well, this came out of the latter half of the 19th century. And the connection to me, the connect, huh? David Hilbert, Ernest Mach. I mean, those are two of the leading cases. Uh, Moritz Schlick. Later in the early, into the 20th century, people, von Neurath, von Neumann, Norbert Wiener is a generation later. Wittgenstein, who is a very strange figure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you were saying that that uh, creative thought comes from there is associated with music and, and not math, but math is consistent with deductive logic. But Euclidean ge geometry is only one subsection of math. Would you say that in general? Do you think there's no nothing constructive about deductive thinking at all? It's all, you know. No, there's nothing constructive in it. By definition, it's not constructive. Now, I mean, the question of what some people like uh, uh, different kinds, uh, a mathematician like Leibniz, who was not just a mathematician, but uh, who did mathematics, like Leibniz or Gauss or Riemann, what you'll find is these are individuals who, who deal with the physical world and try to construct a mathematical language to deal with the new discoveries. So it's not deductive. In fact, what you find with these characters is they're often demonstrating that in order to deal with new physical phenomena, we need some development in the mathematical language itself. To the extent you look at it that way, so for example, both Gauss and Riemann 
develop complex function theory. I mean, before that, a complex number was just a scribble. People didn't know what it meant. It didn't mean anything. When you get to Gauss and Riemann, they demonstrate that these kinds of mathematical languages are required to deal with certain kinds of physical processes. Or the same thing goes with, um, uh, you know, some people say, well, didn't Riemann develop a certain mathematics and then Einstein used it? Not quite. Because Riemann developed the mathematics that he did because he was already looking in the direction that Einstein was looking. So that in effect, when Einstein came along and needed a mathematics, it had been worked on by Riemann from the standpoint of, because Riemann was look, working, on, uh, working on light, heat, electri electromagnetism, and a concept of how to make these things work, understand them within one mathematical language. But he saw the mathematical language as subservient to the physics. That's why I read that quote. As subservient to the realities. And uh, you know, it's also worth noting that by the time you get to this period of a real flourishing of an effort at science, it's completely intertwined with classical music. I mean, uh, Lynn has made the point Einstein was, but not just Einstein. Einstein was a, a fairly a semi-professional musician. So was Nernst, so was Ehrenfest. So were many, many of the scientists. So was Max Planck. Max Planck almost became a musician. He was a, he was a, a concert level pianist. I'll give you an example of something. If I can find it. So you're saying that mathematics is not the discovery, but it's, it is no. merely the classification of the. Well, it's an effort to find a way to use it, to express it in a mathematical language. Lindsay, the relevant broader European cultural origin of the delusion known as universal entropy is indicated in Plato's systematic attack on such depravity, depravity as that in his Parmenides. A systematic error typified by the Aristotelian tradition of the Delphi Apollo Dionysus cult. As this tradition is typified in a most relevant way by the case of that systematic fraud best known as Euclidean geometry. The assumption that the core belief can be confined to a set of a priori assumptions which are in turn presumed to underlie completely a system of deduction defines the problem, the mistaken a priori notion of mathematical completeness. And that's what this idea that you have a deductive completion means it's dead, it's finished. Per, the per, perfection is a problem. If you think of perfection as a fixed state of somehow the, the most of everything, well of all good things, then the universe is dead. Might as well be yeah. Do you mind if I say one thing in support of your point? Yeah. Um, my mom's teaching in Harlem Psychology of Art right now. She's great, of course, and one of the things that she's found in support of your, your notion is that you know, when you look at patterns of neurotransmission, if you have somebody listen to Mozart um, repeatedly, yeah. you can actually find measurable changes in the brain from mm -hmm. creative thinking and see it occurring. There's also particularly a concern because I'm also an educator in terms of the dumbing down of education at the lower level and the college level. There's a very strong push in the CUNY system now for some kind of financial contract where they're, they're going to get the money that it's going to be dependent on much more of sort of rote learning mm -hmm. and, um, and job applied learning. When we know critical thinking is really what helps people to mm -hmm. learn and create other <coughs> possibilities, and it's being tied to financial limitations. Yeah. In the school system, now not only do they just teach, teach for the test, yeah. but yeah. they're more and more looking towards this rote, automatized learning through the well, computer, not in creative. Training. They're looking for something that, that, in effect, has a monetary value. You can do this, you'll get something in return. This is a skill that we can use, then we can, you, we can use it. We do not want to develop the intellect. We don't want to develop the creative mind. Look, science is often, uh, on, on its surface, purposeless. In other words, you're, you're experimenting. You've got ideas that you know function. You have things that you want to do, but you don't know how to get there. So you, you, there's a quality of play in true science that has to exist. I, I'll give you an example. This is Planck. The physicist is bound by the very nature of the task in hand 
to use his imaginative faculties as the first step he takes. For the first stage of his work must be to take the results furnished by a series of experimental measurements and try to organize them under one law. That is to say, he must select according to a plan which will in the first instance be hypothetical and therefore a construction of the imagination. This means that his imaginative powers must always be speculating on the significance of the data which have been furnished through experimental measurement and so on and so forth. Okay, imagination, whoever thinks of that as being what a scientist does. Or another example from Planck. It's not a loose imagination. It's not whatever you feel like. It's an imagination based on pre previous hypotheses, based on, I would say something else in a minute. The creations of art, now this is Planck also, the creations of art are similar to those of science, at least to the extent that scientific research in the strictest sense of the term could never advance without the creative force of the imaginative intellect. The, the man who cannot occasionally imagine events and conditions of existence that are contrary to the causal principle as he knows it will never enrich his science by the, the addition of a new idea. So you can't have scientists without classical culture, without, without a primacy on the development of the creative powers of the mind. This is what Lynn has recently talked about as what I would say is where does this come from? It, Lynn talks about recently the fourth phase space. You know, for those of you, you, you have the, the prebiotic or what you call, the lithosphere, the inanimate crust of the planet. You have the biosphere, which has living matter and the results of living matter. And you have the noosphere, which is the product of cognitive activity which shapes biotic and prebiotic material. Now, these things don't exist separately. They interact. In some way, they're able to exist in the same universe. Now, what gives you a clue as to how they exist? Human beings, at the level of the development of human ideas and social discourse about those ideas, are constantly discussing the principles and conveying the principles that govern those three areas. We're constantly discovering how each of those areas develop and how we can utilize them in the development of our action on the planet, on the universe. So the fourth phase space is the, phase, is the space of creative human mentation as a social dialogue. How do real ideas work? Huh? Isn't that the noosphere, no, it's not the noosphere. It's what creates the products of the noosphere. It's what allows us to act on the lithosphere and the biosphere to create the noosphere, which are the products of creative mentation acting on the universe, on the biosphere and the lithosphere. That creates a noosphere, which gives us more to act upon. But it's the space of creative human mentation. And what is it? Think about what, you, what we really are as human individuals. We're engaged in a dialogue with people who have been dead for thousands of years. We're engaged in an implicit dialogue with generations to come. That's what goes on in our mind now when we're thinking. That's where the imagination comes from. What, is human society, what have been the development of the ideas of human history that have given us progress and development, given us greater control, more human beings? That's a whole other story. But what is it that's created the ability for six billion people to live? And what do we have to create out of that into the future? That's what creates in the mind the mission and that is the, the capability, taking the store of what other human beings have done and using that to awaken in yourself the ability to generate principles that human beings can act upon to improve and develop human existence. That's where classical art comes from. Because what is classical art? It's an expression of the communication of ideas amongst human beings about human beings.
Yeah. Regarding the, the economic system, the blowout, would it be healthy to have speculative derivatives on a limited form no. or, or not literally one dollar should be? You, look, by, by all rights, there should be no trading in secondary debt. Boom, period. No secondary markets in debt. Not one dollar. What about 50 cents? <laughs> yeah, I'm not trading a descendant in for cash. Now, you, you know, you might as well bet. Look, you could, you, from the standpoint of derivative, you could bet on the following. You could go down to uh, Belmont Raceway, racetrack, okay? You could then have a market that where you would bet on the outcome of the bets made at the racetrack. That's a derivative. If people go and they bet on horse number one, horse number one goes off at five to two, horse number four goes off at three to two, and horse number nine goes off at 15 to one. Okay, now I, then you can place a bet on that one of those three is going to win. And that it's good, moreover, you can bet that by the time the horse that one of those three goes off, the one that's at 15 to one is going to be at 12 to one, the one that's at five to two is going to be seven to two, and the one that's three to two is going to be two to one. And within certain confines, you can place that bet and if they come in that way, you win the bet and you win a certain amount of money. Or you can place bets on the horses to win or lose systematically yeah. so that you get money no matter what. Yeah, <laughs> you can try to do that. What? <laughs> well, you can bet. You can bet on all the different horses. You can bet on all the horses. Well, actually, the way they would do it, the way they would do it, because you've got to win something, and they, you call arbitrage. Now, the way you do this is because, and the way you would play it, is because the odds on the horses change. Okay, the trick would be to cash in right before there was a change such that it would all come out even and you might win 1% because you happen to cash in just before the horse went from 7 to 2 to 5 to 2. That's what, that's what currency speculation is. In other words, part of what they do in currency speculation is they'll buy on the New York market and sell on the Tokyo market. And they sell on the Tokyo market before the New York prices come in. So they can get that little bit of difference as the price of the currency changes. Right, so you know longer betting on the rate and betting on the ship from the yacht. Yeah, right. So, so. <laughs> so 1% is one thing. Well, it's a whole other thing also when they're betting $100 billion that they don't have. Okay? Because that's what it is. No, the way they do it is they borrow $100 billion based on their word as great speculators, and they pay it off the next morning because they made 1% on $100 billion and they never had a penny in the deal. It's all borrowed money. It's all leverage. The great game is leverage. And leverage is? The ability to borrow a lot based on a small amount. Like, if, uh, let's say I have a dollar in the bank, but I'm considered the world's greatest hedge fund operator. I can take that dollar and get a million dollars. That's leverage. Some of these things are as simple as you like. It just means the ability to con somebody. It means the ability to con society. Yeah. Okay. Just to, just to connect this up with what you were um, setting up as a foundation for us in the beginning about the environmentalism and bubbles and all of that is that the cap and trade program is um, will be based on a speculative market based on the industry. Right. Yeah. Look, the whole idea is that real human activity, real social activity, real production doesn't mean anything. You can, you can, what are you trading in cap and trade? You're trading what supposedly you're not emitting. So you're trading nothing. There's no productive activity. There's no change in the, in the ability of human beings to improve their existence. 
You're trading the non-production of something. In other words, you're effectively in the third world trading the cutting back on industrial activity for money. But what can the money buy? Nothing. Nobody's producing what you need. The third world countries know this too because they're yeah. starting to yeah. speak up about it. Absolutely. They understand it perfectly. Yeah, they don't want to develop any part of it. Uh, could, you, could you clear up something about music, creativity, classical music, creativity? I think you need yeah. to, as well, opposed to music from all cultures. Well, they, they, it's not a matter of music from a country. It's a matter of the quality of the music involved. I mean, look, what music... In other words, in other words, what's so great about classical music? That's the white man music. Yeah, what about my music? It is, look, everybody has this. Everybody has this. There's, look, everybody has this. There's all kinds of folk music and different cultural reflections of efforts at music. Most of them have the flaw that they don't develop. They represent a certain emotional quality. They represent a certain tradition. Fine. But uh, music that represents the development of ideas, where the music itself is communicating a sense of development and progress, of ideas of human creativity. That's a unique area of, of, of music, wherever it might occur. Okay. You know, for example. Does any classical uh, music have that? No, it doesn't. I, you know, quarter notes, not really. I mean, the problem is, look, it, it comes from somewhere. These things are not out of nowhere, OK? You know, music essentially comes from the prosody of language, OK? In other words, you're trying to convey an idea. Most of what's in a discussion, even though you know, I'm losing my voice, but um, is in the music. It's in the tonality of the discussion. I could take the words that I'm saying uh, and put them on a monotone, and they would lose a good deal of their meaning. Emphasis, expression, inflection. That's how real ideas are, con are conveyed. <clears throat> but how do you decipher those ideas and discussions? You have to do it. But you know, look, certain ideas in science, certain people convey an idea in science. Some people don't. So you look at the ways in which ideas are actually conveyed. I'll give you an example. Look, uh, there's a real useful example in, in this, because this is the, one of the great traps, my music. There's no such thing as my music. Just like there's no my science, and there's no my uh, social progress, there's no my history, and so on and so forth. Most of us are the, uh, the outcome and the product of a whole civilizational development. Yes, there are language cultures. But the question is, how do you develop those language cultures to express higher order ideas? If a culture, for example, when Italian was used before the Roman Empire, you developed a, a, a culture where the average yeoman farmer was more educated, more developed, more intelligent. You had the same thing with the development of languages in the Middle Ages. You had lousy languages. See, this is people. Crummy languages. German stunk until people like Leibniz and Kastner came along. Italian was nothing until, uh, for, for 1,500 years until you had Dante. And so, so you create languages. And in the course of creating those languages, you're tr creating, you do that through the development of poetry. Because poetry creates ideas that didn't exist in the language. It forces the mind to generate new ideas. A lot of this comes out of paradox. Uh, Planck says, in order for science to progress, you need different observations that contradict, that have to be resolved. Now, I'll give you an example of this, because this is, this is sort of, to me, one of the tragedies of all this. Uh, Dennis knows it. When, when Dvorak, uh, Brahms sent Dvorak to the United States. Because Brahms was concerned that classical music was coming to an end, that there was a deadness in Europe. And there were no great classical composers after him, and there weren't. So he sent Dvorak to the United States with the project 
since the United States was a relatively lively culture. And Dvorak came up with the idea that the best potential basis for the development of a new orders of classical music that would be developed where you would use, you would develop the kinds of contrapuntal ideas that Bach had worked on, that Mozart and Beethoven had worked on with new material, was the, uh, uh, the spiritual. That's what he worked with. And he began to set up projects to develop the spiritual and classical forms of it. He recruited people to it. And what happened? Basically, a lot of these, huh? What year is this? This is like 1880, 1890. OK. What happens is 18, yeah. Well, what happens is these guys under Jim Crow, a lot of these guys who were, who were being incorporated into classical institutions were kicked out. They were told they couldn't do it. They, you know what they were told? This ain't your music. You shouldn't bother with this. It's white man. The, the first, first person who said, this is white man's music, was a white man. And the problem was that under the, the degree of persecution, too many African Americans said, OK, I can't go there. This is not my music. You had the Fisk choral singers and so on and so forth. And they were all cut out. OK, a lot of the early. A lot, of the, yeah, a lot of the early jazz musicians were classically trained, and they were told, you can't do this. OK? This is not your music. Work on your music. Jazz. Where did jazz? Who were the biggest purveyors of jazz? Gut, blues. Yeah, well, there was blues, there was rag, but then there was Gershwin. Oh, yeah. OK? So what people think is their music is not their music. Klezmer is not the music of the Jewish people. It could drive you nuts. OK? Makes you want to have a Nagila. Right? So what do you, what you're, a good example of this is, you know, um, just, this is just an example of, of the way a poetic idea works. But this is just a start. I don't mean, but you have to think of these things. And it's it, there's a music in the language. Most of us don't know how to speak, you know, but they, once upon a time, people knew how to speak. There are classic stories about this. You know, um, think about the fact that a guy like Lincoln, during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, in open air, spoke to 10 to 20,000 people sometimes and was heard for three hours, along with Stephen Douglas, to the back of that audience. You know, most of us have a problem projecting to a 50-person room. We used to know a guy uh, I used to like, a guy named Eulen Jack, who was uh, the borough president of Manhattan. Uh, you know, he, he was, uh, I guess he was born around 1906, something like that. And this was a guy who was about five feet, six inches tall, and he had one of these barrel chests. And you could hear him, he could whisper, and you could hear him across the street. Because he, his voice projected, he resonated. There's a way of speaking that changes the whole sound of what you're doing, and in many ways the meaning. But a good example, I'll give you one of my favorite examples. I'm not going to give you a bonus, but. This is Shelley. It's useful to talk about Shelley because Lynn brings Shelley up a lot. And if you, this is a simple approach, but take um, to a skylark. One of my favorite examples. Hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest, like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest, and singing still dost soar, and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, o'er which clouds are brightening, thou dost float and run, like an unbridled joy whose race has just begun. 
The pale purple even melts around thy flight like a star of heaven in the broad daylight. Thou art unseen, but yet I hear thy shrill delight. Now, what's interesting to me about it is you can sort of take it as, okay, it's to a skylark, it's beautiful images. But Shelley's also having a lot of fun because if you look at this, none of it makes any sense. First of all, you say to a skylark and then he says, bird, thou never work. So it's not a bird. It's something else. That, uh, that from heaven or near it pours with a, of unpremeditated art. Now art, the word art means premeditated, artifice. Unpremeditated. So it's not a bird. It's unpremeditated art. Like a cloud of fire. Now, fires are not clouds. It's either a cloud, which is water vapor, or it's a fire, which leaves no vapor. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun. Now, you know, here we're getting, you begin to see where he's going because it's true. Golden lightning of the sunken sun. Now, it is true. After the sun sets, you can still see it because it's refracted. Now, by the way, Shelley was a guy who was a teenager, was fascinated with science. There are many stories about how he would set up electrical experiments in his room and he almost electrocuted a few people. Okay? He took it seriously. All right? Like an unbodied joy whose race has just begun. At any rate, the whole point is it's full of apparent contradictions, paradoxes. Why? Because he's in a certain sense setting you up. Because the, the last part of the poem is about how you create a, a poetry. How this is an artist. And how an artist works to create a new idea out of something that didn't exist. What do you do in language? What is the poet doing? He's talking about things that didn't exist before. What is a scientist doing? He's talking about things that didn't exist before. The poet is changing the language through which society is able to communicate ideas. So the poet is bringing new ideas in. And it's in that that music resides. Po you know, music is, the, is, in a sense, created by the prosody of great poetry. And that's what you're looking for. That's classical music. That's the same kind of classical art that Planck and Einstein refer to that's essential to their ability to create scientifically provable ideas. So this idea of you know, my music, no, there's, there's, there's human music that takes the existing language cultures and tries to find a way to express that quality of music in all the language cultures. But we don't have it in all the language cultures. Right now, we don't have it in hardly any. Look, I would argue that what you go to uh, hear a classical musical performance, and in nine cases out of 10, you're not hearing classical music. You're hearing the reading of a text. You're hearing either the reading of a text or some piece of junk. I had an experience that blew me away. Maybe it's not worth it, but you know. Um, how, how to destroy, actually this is an interesting example of it actually destroys the musician. Uh, I went to the LA uh, Symphony Orchestra a few years ago, which is, you know, it's, it is considered a good orchestra, it probably is, but they were doing a special piece, and this was a, unbelievable, they were doing the Ninth Symphony. So we went naively thinking we were going to see the Ninth Symphony, or hear the Ninth Symphony. Now, we get there, and you know, uh, I have a, you know, I, well, we get there, and they're 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 um, combining a celebra a memorial of the Shoah, the Holocaust, with the Ninth Symphony. So what do they do? This is under this guy Esa Pekasalin. They they have a chorus, a men's chorus, which sings. Arnold Schoenberg's version of the Kaddish. Now, the Kaddish is the memorial, is the is the funeral uh, dirge that you know, the funeral prayer that you say over the prayer for the dead. 
okay? So they take a male chorus and they sing the Kaddish by Arnold Schoenberg, which is a serial version of it. But, oh no, it's even worse. It's, wait, I haven't gotten to the really bad part. Uh, the, the male chorus, like Miles Davis, sings with their back to the audience. It, because it's supposed to be a certain level of disdain and you know, blah, blah, blah. And they sing this thing, which is an awful piece of dissonant garbage, you know, basically. And then, as, as soon as they're finished, without any pause, the, or the, the symphony starts the Ninth Symphony. Now, I'll tell you something. This is a professional, top-of-the-line symphony orchestra. They were so off, it was, out of belief. It was unbelievable. They, it was absolutely impossible to do. You couldn't convey a Beethovenian idea in the wake of that. Actually, it was interesting because, you know, the Ninth Symphony is a relatively long piece. So by the time they got to about the end of the third and into the fourth movement, the choral movement, they did get better. The further they got from this display, the better they got. The music began to take them over. But it, the whole first movement was lost. Okay? So it is possible to destroy anything. Classical music means real ideas, real development of ideas. And the problem that you face is you have to have real classical music. You can't say, well, you know, classical music is not tradition. Classical music doesn't mean old. Classical music is not, you know, uh, what do they call it? Um, it's not because it's plastic. Uh, wax. It's not wax. It's not if it's on a wax record, it's classical. Classical music is a certain quality of idea. It's a transmission of a self-developing idea. Self-developing. Yeah. You, yeah you, you want to set off in the human mind a process that leads the human being to reflect on the entire piece of music as one idea. So that the person realizes there's something new in their mind having listened to the music. It wasn't just a string of sounds. And it wasn't just an emotion. Self-reflexive? Yeah. yeah. Self-subsisting positive. Similar, yeah, it's along those lines, yeah. Well what is what is what is what is self how would you It's something that develops apply this, this idea of self-subsisting positive to the world economy and to uh, Mr. Well, that, LaRouche's Mr. Mr. LaRouche's economics. That, but that's what it is. What Lynn is saying is that human economy is something that develops the powers of the human members who make up society. So it's one to it's human society has a certain mission, which is the development of the creative powers of the members who make up that society. And that gives us our ability to go into the universe. And gives us the ability to uh, make people's lives well, make people's more, life but more like more more like being created human beings it, than living like animals. But it means that they can contribute to generations into the future. It gives them look the human beings. This is real. It's not the easiest thing to deal with because people get silly about it. But human beings have a quality of immortality. I'm not going to argue about whether there's a substance of a soul or religious belief. But if you are human and you have idea an idea and you act on that idea. And in doing that, you're communicating that idea to future generations so that they can act on it. Then, in a certain way, your personality exists in the future human beings. In the same way, the best example, because we haven't, is if you study Kepler, if you study Schiller, and if you begin to know how that person developed those ideas, what they went through, if you try to reconstruct in your mind the life of the person that you're studying, that you're thinking about, and then you form in your mind those ideas that per associated with that person, that person comes alive in your mind. And that person's personality lives in you. So every soul 
is always attached to a corporeal part, as Leibniz said. But it's not their own corporeal part. You live, today, Lincoln lives in those in the United States who wish to live in that tradition. Roosevelt is alive if we build a CCC, the way Lynn has put it. All these people live if we make them alive by guaranteeing that that which they wish to contribute is transmitted through us into the future. That's what Lynn is talking about. That's immortality. That's immortality. That, the rest is... Yeah. Past, present, right. So you live into the... It doesn't mean you live a million years. It means you live now knowing that that's true. In the back there. Wait a minute. You. Yeah, so is it fair to say that we, we as uh, citizens have the indebted responsibility to keep the creative yes. uh, ideas ever flowing? That's a citizen. That's almost the definition of a citizen. That's why I said, if you look at the preamble of the Constitution, it says, for our posterity. That th this nation exists, really, for the future. At, at every moment in time, the nation exists for the future. And that's what you know. You're creating the ability of the human species to expand and to know ever more about creation. We're going to end it now. <laughs>